Look at this headline by The Guardian. Indians were attacked in Leicester. It was the Indian community that was facing mob violence and were living in fear. It was all recorded on viral videos. But somehow it was pertinent to mention Hindu nationalism in the United Kingdom and blaming the Hindu community for the trouble that they had faced. So I decided to look closely at the global press coverage on India and I found a consistent glaring theme that no matter what good India did, it was always going to be strong, scathing words targeting India in general and Hindus in particular. Objective critique or a deliberate bias? Let's find out. Look at this headline by the Washington Post. India is in danger of missing the G20 moment. It has to live up to its own ideals. G20 has just started. Like literally, India got its presidency in December 2022 from Indonesia. And barely a few days ago, the publicity events by the government started. There is one whole year to go. But apparently, we're already missing out on the moment. India celebrated its 75th Independence Day and with pride as always. Knowing that we have come so far, we are still a strong and a stable nation given the turmoil that our neighbour nations are going through. We're also watching carefully how the other half of once undivided India, now Pakistan, has descended into chaos and turned into a completely failed state. We are acknowledging our achievements and we would like to celebrate it on 15th August. But this is what Al Jazeera had to say that we have little to celebrate. They're citing some economic crisis for India. At a time when the International Monetary Fund has said, India is the only bright spot on a dark horizon. Some trivia for you. Al Jazeera is funded by the Qatari government. They have never spoken a word against the Qatar royal family. They were even called out for the lopsided coverage on governments that may have fallen out of favour with the Qatar rulers. But sure, please go ahead, tell India how we should be drowning in sadness and how dare we feel proud of how far our country has come. Al Jazeera's Berlin correspondent, Akhtam Suleiman, left the news outlet saying that it felt its primary funder, the Qatari government, exerted too much influence over Al Jazeera's coverage, for example, on Syria and on Libya too. Time magazine says, how long will Joe Biden pretend that Modi's India is our democratic ally. They're saying that it's becoming increasingly difficult to overlook India's fast-declining democratic standards. India's fast-declining democratic standard. Literally, as I speak right now, people of colour are being killed in the United States of America. Tyre Nichols, a 29-year-old, was on his way home when the Memphis police pulled him over for alleged reckless driving and shot him dead. Keenan Anderson, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor are just three names in hundreds where the US police have shot dead people of colour on mere suspicion. Oh, this is apart from the mass shooting that is a weekly occurrence now in America. It's a gun epidemic, literally. There is an easy access to ammunition from local markets. Mass murders in schools, department stores, on the streets. Just like that. Compare this to India where a licensed weapon is very difficult to possess and law and order in many states where such crime was very common has been reduced in great measure. And how many mass shootings have you seen in schools across India? We hope that never happens. But this also means India 1, USA 0 on this. Let's now come to COVID pandemic. It's the favourite stake that the Western media likes to beat India with. India did lose many people around us to the COVID pandemic, specifically in 2021. But we also came out stronger as a nation. We manufactured our own vaccines and refused to be arm-twisted by the West. But here's what the US media had to say about us. Officially, India has the world's second worst COVID-19 outbreak. Unofficially, it says it's almost certainly the worst. India is one-third the size of the United States of America, but is also one of the most populous. Despite the over billion people that we have, the geography, the diversity that is around us, we still managed to successfully survive the pandemic eventually. And we did not descend into chaos, importantly, like our neighbour nation China did. Sure, go ahead, point out the flaws of the government. That must be done. But do not devalue our success and our survival that we managed in many ways on our own. Despite better infrastructure in the West, lakhs of people died in the first wave of COVID-19 in 2020 in the US, UK and the Europe. But there were no screaming headlines, no disturbing images of dead bodies put on the first page to show how their respective government or the nation had failed. But for India, they were happy to show corpses and cremation, death and mayhem consistently. Then there is the NYT, a prestigious newspaper. But is there an increasing anti-India bias and how? 
This is what the New York Times published, a propaganda piece as an opinion article by Pakistan's former Prime Minister Imran Khan. If the world does nothing to stop the Indian assault on Kashmir and its people, it said, two nuclear armed states will get ever closer to a direct military confrontation. Seriously? Pakistan has blatantly, openly sponsored jihadist brutalities in Kashmir, first on the minority Hindus and then on the Muslims who rose against terrorism. From elected heads like Benazir Bhutto to military dictators, they've collectively ruined Kashmir, occupied parts of Jammu and Kashmir since 1947, exterminated indigenous people and have now the audacity to blame India for defending its territory. But the question is, why give them that space? When 40 paramilitary soldiers of the CRPF were killed in a terror attack in Pulwama in Kashmir in 2019, the Jesh e Mohammed took responsibility. But the New York Times chose to call it simply an explosion. Boom. Staying with Kashmir. When Article 370 was abrogated, mayhem and anarchy were expected. It had been the norm for years in conflict torn valley. Instead, there was no mass violence, no mass pellet injuries, no mass shooting. I had walked on the streets of Kashmir reporting during this period. There was an eerie calm, there was shock and uncertainty, but no mass violence. But here's what the New York Times published. A living hell, they said in headline. Ask Kashmiri pundits what hell was in Kashmir in the 1990 and continues to be for many of them. Staying with the pundits, they are the Hindu minority and are barely 3,000 now left in the Muslim-majority Kashmir Valley. When Rahul Bhatt, an employee from this community, was shot dead in his office in Kashmir in May 2021, and then it also shot off series of about 20 murders by the jihadists of innocent Indians. The New York Times, or nobody from the foreign press, rushed to publish similar heart-wrenching stories right away. Instead, the Washington Post gave a platform to Rana Ayub, a columnist, to publish this. This is called silencing victim voices in the first draft of history. So how are journalists recruited from India in the foreign press, you wonder? Going by this NYT job posting, I think we can take a guess. They were looking for a business correspondent, but the requisite did not involve competence in business, stock market or industry evaluation numbers. But they had whole two paragraphs against Modi, Hindutva, muscular nationalism, attack on multicultural faith in India. Are you looking for a business expert or a political propagandist? Why should political religious views of a business reporter matter to a global publication? Think if this is their recruitment policy, if at all. And you thought merit and hard work is what is needed to get into the global press. I'm doing this video today because recently there's been a huge showdown that happened over BBC docu-series. The British Broadcasting Corporation did a two-part series attacking Prime Minister Modi's tenure as the Chief Minister of Gujarat during the 2002 riots. It was based on a report by Jack Straw, then British Secretary of Foreign Affairs. Remember the one uh, about regarding Iraq war and the weapons of mass destruction that were never found? Exactly, that one. So the Indian government decided to put forth an advisory. They said this was a blatant propaganda, they called it colonial mindset and decided to give an advisory removing it from select digital platform. But it became even a bigger furor on the streets in India. There were universities, the left wing and the Congress party jumped to screen these versions in universities, specifically in Kerala, Bengal and Delhi. They called this a ban on the freedom of speech. It was complete mayhem for some days. The BJP supporters also swung into action. They defended the decision and criticized the BBC for selective nature of reporting, called it hypocrisy. And there were the Indian diaspora also protesting outside the BBC headquarters in England. Many also asked that there were Indian institutions from police to judiciary that had set up committees to investigate into this violence. Why did that not find a mention in the BBC docu-series? But the issue is not that. Issue is more than that because what unfolded in England was very interesting. Pakistan origin British Member of Parliament Imran Hussain in the UK charged at Indian origin Prime Minister Rishi Sunak and demanded answers. He used some inappropriate words as well, attempting to corner him. Sunak, however, decided to snub him in return and said he does not agree with the characterization. Here's what happened. Does the Prime Minister agree with his diplomats in the Foreign Office that Modi was directly responsible? And just what more does the Foreign Office know of his involvement in this grave act of ethnic cleansing? 
Mr Speaker, the UK Government's position on this has been clear and long-standing and and hasn't changed. Of course, we don't tolerate persecution where it appears anywhere, but I'm not sure I agree at all with the characterisation that the Honourable Gentleman has put forward. BBC is a renowned international media network known for coverage of historical events world over. But when was the last time they criticised this, the Royal Family of Britain, or did an elaborate series on the Churchill-era British policies that killed about 3 million of our people because our food was distributed to British soldiers during the World War. Or the years of constant loot plunder by the greatest British empire that never set and the horror inflicted on its dark-skinned colonies. Remember, it is from this horror that one of the colonies that India was emerged within 70 years to become a global leader today. And we have every reason to be proud of it. So there is definitely a bias that we can see among the global press. There is a prism of black and white with which many among the global press still want to view India. This cannot be ignored, but it is also not recent. Look at this report from 1976 by India Today. Non-aligned news pool on the Western media where dominant Western media is always looking at developing countries through the coloured glass of an entirely different value system. In a sense, majority of the developing countries that were former colonies which today constitute one of the most potent forces of the world. It's been more than 40 years. Has anything changed? Remember, India did change. It took a giant leap in space exploration. But for the Western media, we're still a cattle class. This September 2014 cartoon by the NYT had massive outrage against it. And rightly so. India is imperfect. But we're also incredible in our passion to continue to critique ourselves and evolve with the years. It is the Western world that is in crisis today. India's economy is fairly stable. We are projected as per the IMF at 6.1%. It is the highest among all nations. We are still fairly secular and tolerant. We are home to refugees who are being persecuted in Afghanistan, Pakistan or elsewhere around us. And we also now have an independent foreign policy. For example, on the Russia-Ukraine war. We are not going to be dictated by the West anymore. Is that what's troubling the West and its media? 56th edition of The Communicator, it's a peer-reviewed journal of the Indian Institute of Mass Communication published in 2021 that the foreign media outlets have grown exponentially in India and how? By using divisive and negative words while they were reporting on India. The analysis of global media coverage of events in India, it's a report written by analyst and journalist Amol Parth, analyzed over 3,000 reports of various international publications. In 500 headlines, this is what they found. Fear, hate, violence, riot, Hindu, Muslim, Kashmir, cow, mob, protest. By March 2019 and 2021, the New York Times has witnessed its global readership decline by 8%, but for Indian readership, it rose by 22%. Time magazine saw a rise in readership of 50% in India, even though globally they were declining by 31%, according to this report. Look carefully, the BBC had a remarkable nearly five-fold growth in India over its global growth, specifically during the Delhi riots and the COVID-19 dead bodies. As I speak right now, Germany's DW Network has published a video report showing Indian women are fighting for their right to wear the hijab. Hijab is not banned in India. Women all around us, all across the country, continue to wear it. It was in one school, in one state, over a school uniform that was enforced hijab or the full body veil which is the burqa was not allowed and it snowballed into this politics protest debate over religion versus school uniform one state and even in Karnataka I must add here there are minority education institutions that still permit and always did the religious dress code even in uniform look at the words that were used by the DW network Islamophobia Hindu India fear and fight Hijab, I repeat, is not banned in India. Go for a walk across any city in the country and decide for yourself. As I conclude, foreign press is crucial for any democracy, just as national press or smaller media groups that report on local issues. But while the last two impact, possibly within a region, global press can impact global discussions. And hence, sending out a message constantly that India is the only aggressive Hindu majority out to exterminate minorities, muscular nationalism, to portray action against terrorism as action against people. This narrative is not just incorrect, it's also dangerous. And let me give you a trivia about my world, which is India. Indians love to criticize their politicians. We actually love to ensure no VIP neta thinks he or she is above the law. We have elections. We change governments as and when. We realize that we are fed up with this neta. But we can also point out when there is fair criticism 
and when the foreign press is deliberately pushing an agenda to harm country's image. India is on its way to become a global leader, a space explorer, an economic power, and I hope we can eradicate all wrongs around us too. But we know when the section of foreign press is targeting our rise with selective reportage, and we will call that out too. Thank you for watching.